to this live broadcast from True Fire Studios. You are in for a really special treat today. Uh, it's been our treat this week uh, to welcome Scott Sherrard to the True Fire family. He's here filming his very first True Fire course. Uh, man, Scott has been on our radar screen, I don't know, for such a long time. And we have uh, uh, Jason Lachlan to thank for finally connecting us, getting uh, you know our schedules meshed up. Um, this first True Fire project is called Southern Roots. We'll tell you all about it in a minute. Um, but for those of you that uh, need an introduction, uh, Scott is widely known as the lead guitarist and musical director of the Greg Almond Band. Uh, he's not only an amazing guitar player, he's also a talented, prolific songwriter, great singer, uh, has released eight albums of his own, received a Grammy nomination for Best American Root Song uh, for a tune called My Only True Friend, which he co-wrote with Greg Almond. Billboard magazine calls him one of the best guitarists in the country. I love this quote from Greg Allman. Uh, Greg says, I know all about guitar players. I've seen the very best. And Scott Sherrard is the perfect guitarist for my band. He understands that you don't need to play just for the sake of playing. Scott isn't one of those guys who thinks they get paid by the note. He never steps on the vocals, and he leaves plenty of room for everyone else to do their thing. But when it's time to solo, Scott delivers, boy. That's from Greg Allman. Uh, let's see. Rave review of Scott's Saving Grace album from Rolling Stone says, A blast of brassy grit, full of vocal harmonies and white hum. White Hot Almond Brothers Worthy Guitar Moves. Let's say hey to Scott. Enough of me talking. We'll get to more of Scott playing, telling us what this new course is all about. Hey, man. Hey, hey, what's up? <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you there. I always hate, like, you know, talking over great playing, but... I guess that's the biz here with these live you're, broadcasts. You're in good company. A lot of people have talked over my playing for many years. Um, those are some pretty impressive quotes. I, I, I just pulled out a couple, man. You have um, just a stellar reputation, and we are thrilled to finally get you here in the studios and do some True Fire stuff together. Well, thanks, man. You know the feelings are mutual. You guys are... Uh... You're a class act, man. <laughs> well, thank I don't you. think you could do it better than how you guys have figured it <laughs> oh, out. Oh, thank you, man. We've I had fun anybody here. To come here. We've had fun here these last couple of Absolutely. days, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you also happen to be um, really just, you know, a great educator. You have a great way of uh, explaining, in some cases, some pretty kind of heady concepts in a very easy and accessible manner. I mean, uh, you've taught before. I know you've done podcasts. You've done some teaching, right? Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, I I um I do a lot of teaching actually. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I'm doing uh, my second uh, summer course for uh, Berkeley College of Music this year. Um, I did it last year as well. Um, you know, I've done different things on the lecture circuit at universities mm -hmm. and uh, in different independent music programs. I worked at uh, Yorma Kalkinen's uh, Fur Peace Ranch mm -hmm. uh, for for one season that was really great. And I teach on Skype too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when, and it, it's really cool cause I teach about 15 to 20 hours of lessons every week, mm -hmm. uh, doing Skype and it really, um, it really, you know, I feel as passionate about education in my genre of music as I do about playing it because I feel like it's really endangered on a multitude of levels, mm -hmm. um, in terms of its survival. Mm -hmm. Um, because I really believe that American roots music has become, um, sort of a, you know, kind of what happened to classical music and jazz music I mm -hmm. see happening now to blues and rock and roll and and all this music that's built around bass, drums, guitar, keyboards. It's mm -hmm. kind of, I call it the new string quartet. So uh -huh. finding any way I can to keep it alive, you know. Well, you're doing, you know, a hell of a job, You're including this first course of yours. Why don't you tell everybody about where you're calling it Southern Roots. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, um... You know, all the music that I love, all the American music that really changed the course of music history in the 20th century was born in the American South. 
Um, and I always like to say that, you know, it started in New Orleans and the Mississippi Delta and worked its way through Chicago and New York and eventually all the way to, uh, to London, as we all know, um, and then back again. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of different genres all within that, that, that were all produced along the lines of that, that, uh, that tributary that was the, the Mississippi River. So jazz, blues, folk, country, um, soul, gospel, and then eventually rock and roll was kind of the, I guess you could call it the end product of all those amazing genres kind of fusing together. And, um, you know, I really feel like blues is like the spine of all that. And I also feel like blues is the defining genre for the electric guitar. Mm -hmm. um, really, all the best guitarists uh, on the electric guitar in history are blues players first. Mm -hmm. You know, all the way from Charlie Christian to Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, They're all blues right. guys. Yeah. So, um, you know, without the blues, you can't do anything really. But without going beyond the blues while using it as our base, it's hard to see the future. So it's all about... You know, really, really, it's about owning uh, this this kind of culture that was that was cultivated, created, and 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 manifested in America. I mean, this is really an expression of of our music as a culture and the successful collaboration of all these different um, people from all over the world. Really, mm -hmm. I love. Um, we were talking earlier, um, and you talk in your course about how. Um, you know, from the South, the music spread to the North, Chicago, New York, over the pond, you yeah. know, to don't forget, England. Don't forget yeah. Detroit, where I'm from. <laughs> and Detroit, of course. Yeah. And how uh, the guitar was really the vehicle for shaping, you know, really significant movement in music, the electric guitar, that yeah. is. Talk to that a little bit. Well, I mean, you know, the the electrification of the guitar, I mean, I really believe it. the Big Bang moment was when Charlie Christian started making records with Benny Goodman. Because to me, he was the first guy who really uh, made the guitar sound like a horn, mm -hmm. which is something I cover in this course as well. Um, and for me, the guitar really ended with, the electric guitar really ended with Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. um, so everything that happened in between, you know, all those great electric blues players from T-Bone Walker through to the Three Kings and Albert Collins, Johnny Guitar Watson, Memphis Slim, and then, of course, we end up with Chuck Berry and uh, the Allman Brothers Band, and then, and then it goes into, uh, you know, the English guys, you know, mm -hmm. all those amazing guitar players, uh, um, Eric Clapton and Peter Green and Jimmy Page, of course, and Keith Richards and... Mick Taylor, I mean, there's all those, uh, those guys all really picked up that baton. But I'd say Hendrix was really, you know, he really achieved the unattainable on all levels. Mm -hmm. And he's the ultimate um, sort of Cuisinart of everything that had come before him in American Roots music because he played as a sideman with, with Little Richard, mm -hmm. with the Isley Brothers, with King Curtis and Cornell Dupree. You know, he lived in New York on the New York City scene where King Curtis and Donny Hathaway and those guys were... Um, so, you know, he really digested everything and then added the English stuff as the cherry on top. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the guitar is the, is the common point between all these different bands. And, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and all those other Pink Floyd, all those other visionary acts from England that took our blues music. And so much of their music is blues-based. I mean, all the early Beatles, Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd stuff, I mean, it's all blues-based, mm -hmm. you know, at its core. Yep. But they took it in all these really interesting directions. So with um, this course, Southern Roots, uh, you brought a really interesting curriculum uh, to the studio. Um, you're kind of uh, examining all of the different, uh, you know, kind of American Roots music and the influence um, and tying it to what we're all playing today, you know, in, in, in the different, let's call it subgenres. Um, so talk about how you've organized the course into the various sections. And then let's do some playing. By, by the way, Jason Lachlan shouts out to you. He's oh, nice. tuned in. Hey, Jason. And uh, for the rest of you out there, please let us know where you're chiming in from and we'll shout out to you. I'm always amazed at how many people are 
tuned in at various time zones in the middle of the night and, you know, breakfast from different countries. But we got Jason here. And Jason, thank you very much for hooking us up with Scott. It's been a terrific yeah, session. That, that man's the reason I'm sitting here right now. So, so here, um, the first section of uh, your course, Blues Influences. Yep. You know, you talk about reedy rhythm, the art of the tripod. Okay. You, you, you pick one key learning from that section. And well, the Jimmy that. Reed piece is really the main thing. And uh, okay. as, as I talk about in the course, the first thing I ever learned to play was a, a Jimmy Reed shuffle pattern on the uh -huh. guitar because it's, it's a two-note rhythm pattern. You mm -hmm. know, it's the one that... I and, of course, that's a, it's a shuffle feel, um, which you know, is a real kind of men from the boys thing to understand in terms mm -hmm. of like understanding swing and how that swing sort of transmutes itself into rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, you have to really be able to have a great shuffle feel to play really any other kind of American music or have the swing, mm -hmm. as it were, you know. So how would you how would you teach a shuffle feel? Well, basically, I mean, you can you can explain it, but you've really got to listen to it and imitate it and feel it because mm -hmm. there's really, I mean, it's like putting a, you could say, you know, technically you could say it's like dotting an eighth note or a quarter mm -hmm. note or something, but really it's putting that sort of hump in the groove. And the difference is like a rock and roll gro groove is like a straight eighth groove. It doesn't mm -hmm. have that bump to the rhythm in it, you know, so it's, that's like a rock groove. But when you swing it, I think you can hear the difference. And what we were talking about the other day, and I'm really passionate about this, is I really believe that all these different genres of American roots music are an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that they're taught that way because there's no way to notate swing. You've got to feel it. You've got to, mm -hmm. and then in a band context of which I talk about with the tripod complex or uh, concept, which is something I got from Jerry Jamat, who I got to work with for a couple of years, a uh, legendary bass player. Um, you know, Jerry used to refer to bass, drums, and guitar as the tripod, as the, th the three things in a modern rhythm section that held up the whole, mm -hmm. the whole thing, and everything kind of goes over that. Mm -hmm. And if that's not strong, things are going to topple over. Mm -hmm. um, with the guitar, and as especially I address, you know, learning it as a rhythm instrument first, you have to learn how to really support the bass, the drums, and, and complement the other instruments and the singer and the song going on around you. And I think that, you know, starting at the most basic with like these Jimmy Reed records where there are actually three guitar parts that I demonstrate because his records have two or three parts that all interlock that make the track. Mm -hmm. That's how you really learn where the guitar needs to fit depending mm -hmm. on what's going on around it. And that's the key sort of jump off point of, of this series. And I think it's it's a universal principle that goes through every genre of American music. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, a, a great starting point for the course. And then in this section, you also talk about you know the stormy Monday, stormy changes. Why don't we Why don't we play that? Okay, roll the track. Let's play that, and then talk to that a little bit. Okay, okay, sounds good. Tommy, you have that track.
Sorry, I'm not I'm not totally with the band in the box today. <laughs> That's great, man. So um, what's interesting is some of the comments online, you know, um, you know, too many notes. No, <laughs> just picking up on um, that would be, would be my uh, no, comment. just picking up on kind of the feel, like a little bit of T-bone in there, a little bit of BB, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, Albert. And what's interesting about that for me is, you know, it's paying off exactly what you talked about, which is, you know, picking up on uh, the roots of the blues and some of the legendary artists, many of whom you've actually played with and certainly, you know, influence and help you develop your own style. Um, and but then you add your own touch to it. And I think that's the great thing about this course is it's not just a study um, in, you know, traditional roots music. It's an homage to roots music, but showing you how to basically, you know, allow that to influence your own voice. And I think that's a, a, a great approach for today's, you know, guitar players. Yeah, I think uh, it reminds me of that quote. I think it's, uh, you can correct me on this. We were talking about paintings earlier, but I think, was yeah. it Picasso who was the one who said, uh, good artists copy, great artists steal? <laughs> I don't know if it was Picasso, but that's... You I know, feel like that was something he no, would have said. Nothing truer, <laughs> uh, certainly in the world of music, right? I mean, it's all I mean, in any, a I think in any art form, you know. I mean, a lot of these, um, a, a lot of these guitar players and horn players, uh, musicians, they create a vocabulary that you're going to quote, and but you're going to, you know, express it in your own voice, which I think is what you're all about. Um, also, in let's see, in the next section, I'm going to try to get through the, all of the sections of your course. Wow, weekend, okay. I, I think it's going to be a real treat for folks. Me and um, my virtual band here. Uh, in section two, you're covering kind of creative approaches, right? Um, and you did a set of lessons on horn line phrasing. Yeah. Could we show folks a little bit about, talk, talk, talk about what, what do you mean by horn line phrasing? Give us a demonstration. And then roll one of these tracks that you demonstrated that over, like the... Okay. What did you use? The, uh, is that the Grant Green thing? Is that, okay, or? so that's the JB. I think it's called the J, kind of like James Brown type track. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do that. Do that. So, okay, so that's... I mean, that track's in the key E flat, so I'll kind of demonstrate in that key as well. Um, e flat is, of course, a very characteristic horn player key. Yep. Horn players love B flat and E flat and F. Uh -huh. um, so uh, that's really cool because it breaks you automatically out of like your typical, you know, usually you'd play in the key of D or the key of E, say, right. in that section of the guitar. Yep. But this is in E flat, which is, you know, a totally different feel. And I also talk a lot about Grant Green in this video, who is one of the greatest electric guitar players of all time, but is not, I, I think he's not as well known as he should be. I mm -hmm. learned about him from a Stevie Ray Vaughan article actually mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Yeah. He was a huge influence on Stevie Ray and mm -hmm. there's a ton of amazing guitar players from all genres who love Grant. But his funk period, which is when he made a bunch of these records that were based on Sly Stone and James Brown and mm -hmm. stuff like that, from the mid 70s to the late 70s are really just these incredible achievements of getting horn-like phrasing, but on a guitar. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I would say what he reminds me the most of is the kind of sax playing that I grew up listening to, which is Maceo Parker, King Curtis, Junior Walker. Mm -hmm. I was always trying to get my guitar to sound like those sax players mm -hmm. as early as I can remember. I was trying to imitate them. And when I heard Grant, it was besides the blues guitar players I love, like the Three Kings and Albert Collins, mm -hmm. they all sound like a horn to me. Mm -hmm. But Grant was the first guy with a clean sound who was able to go in so many different directions. He had the most beautiful tone, and, and the main thing is time feel and rhythm, mm. you know, in terms of being on the one, as they mm -hmm. say, or like being in the pocket with funk playing. And something I highlight in the course is, you know, there's a lot of guitar players who can play the hell out of those Jimmy Nolan rhythm guitar parts mm -hmm. or Leo Nocentelli parts. Right. But when they go to solo, they like step on a wah wah pedal or a fuzz pedal right. and they do like shit that plays over the beat. Right. Instead of staying in the beat. Right. And the great thing for me personally is I, I get to imitate the great horn players and organ players I've heard by using some of what Grant Green did as an approach, but then also trying to bring in some other elements of like, I turn the guitar up a little bit more. 
Mm. So it's got a little more sustain, which makes it sound a little bit more like a B3 organ, because a mm -hmm. B3 organ is, in jazz, it's always compressed and a little distorted. Mm -hmm. So I try to bring some of that in as well, and that's kind of what I'm going for, is like when I'm playing funk, I'm trying to play like a cross between like Chester Thompson and Jimmy Smith, and also uh, like Maceo and King Curtis and, mm -hmm. and Eddie Harris, you know, all those guys who really, uh, and sax players, those sax players in particular, um, they play sort of, even Eddie Harris even had a thing for it called the intervalistic concept. And he has a great book, which I've actually studied a little bit out of. Um, it's very hard to execute on a horn. It's extremely easy to play on the guitar. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of that stuff I highlight on this video too, is like, What's really hard for piano players and horn players is the stuff they work really hard on, yep. and to get that, like the sound of like Herbie Hancock or Wayne Shorter yeah. or, or Macy oh, or King yeah. Curtis, it's very hard on their instruments. But on the guitar, it actually lays straight out. So show us a little. Yeah, I'll show you a little you, bit. You, do you want um, that James Brown track? Pull it up in a second. I'll give you something to look at first. Okay, so, good. So basically, like E flat. Okay, just do like an E flat minor pentatonic. All right. And then moving that around, you know, you get. So that's like the bare bones of what we're doing. And of course, I can throw in a six and a major third and a nine, you know, and a flat five and a five. And when you start adding in all that other detail, you know, to get it to sound horn like, you can also do glissandos and, and pull offs and hammer ons. So instead of playing a phrase like this, like, or instead of playing. You can play like, you know, that makes it sound more like a percussive. You know how those horn players, they'll do those licks where they'll kind of pop the finger pad and you can hear it through their horn? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hearing when I do that. That kind of stuff. Cool. So I got a bunch of little little phrase ideas. And then the thing of playing intervalistically, um, there's that famous, you know, Maceo Parker lick like... <laughs> That kind of stuff, mm -hmm. where you can play. That kind of stuff. Uh -huh. That kind of puts it all together. So, cool. of course, the rhythm is the magic ingredient. Sure. Um, but I don't know. Pull the track up, and I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about. And I'll mix in some of this organ stuff, too. Cool. All right. <laughs>
something like that. <laughs> that was great, man. Really. The, what I love is, um, we, and we've only really just kind of started here, showing the range of what you cover in this course. Um, you made a really good point, man. I mean, everyone, you know, over a groove like that pretty much plays the same thing if you're a guitar player. That's not the same thing. That sounded great over a groove like that. And, and the folks chimed in right now. I, I think uh, agree with me for sure. Um, <laughs> I love this. Carl Shear just said, "Just take my freaking pre-order money now." <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, shout out to your fans who are tuned in right now. And if you haven't chimed in, please chime in. We love to hear where where you're from. Uh, Poland, Fort Collins, Colorado, Stockholm, Sweden, Phoenix, Arizona, India. Montana, Red Lodge, Petaluma, California, the Space Coast here in Florida, Ottawa, Illinois, um, Poland, Maine, Western Penn, uh, Georgia, Birmingham, Alabama, Scarborough, Maine. You have family in Maine or something? No. No? Okay. Uh, New York City? Well, okay. yeah, you got to have that. Got to be somebody in New York watching. Montreal. <laughs> and, uh, and I love this one, too. Claire, frickin' Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we go again. Um, so let's shift gears right away. I want to get as much plane in as possible to, to show the range. So then you do a whole little series on Grant Green devices. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think you do that Chitlin's kind of a groove. Okay, so yeah, well, the Grant is probably more what we just, in general, oh. is more in what we just did. But the, the Chitlin's Concarne groove Yep is talking about uh, Kenny Burrell, who wrote right. Chitlin's okay. Concarne, and yeah, Wes jazz. Montgomery. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Let's do that. Just roll All the right. track, play, and then let's talk about and what you do. And before we start, I have to be yeah. careful with this, because I don't I don't want to set off any any purists out there. Okay. We're going to play a, a groove we found in the computer. Yep. It's Chitwood's Concarne, but it's not the right chord voicings. Okay. <laughs> so the chord voicings are all going to be minor. Yeah. The one, the four, and the five are minor. And in uh, from the Midnight Blue record, the yeah. Kenny Burrell version, the original version, yeah. uh, it's uh, they're all seven sharp nine chords, but they're dominant sevens. Yeah. These are all minor this sevens. This track is in the style of Chitwood's. Yes. Okay? Just being, I'm it's just being clear because I know someone's going to write because oh, I would be the first no, one. Hey, no guys, doubt. why is the four minor? No, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. Down. So, and by the by not my fault. <laughs> it is not your fault. Um, let's do it. Okay.
all roots, right? Something like that. Yeah. Hey, you um, you went to a high school for jazz, right? Was that? Yeah, your- it was a high school of the arts, Milwaukee High School of the Arts. That's where I went to. I got there this my sophomore year of high school. I moved to Milwaukee. Yeah. And I got admitted to that program, and it was amazing, man. Like all my classmates went on to be professional musicians. It's right. crazy. And then at night, as a you know really young player, you'd go out yeah. and play gigs with a lot of legendary you know yeah. cats, well, there, right? There was a club called the Up and Under. Uh, it's still there, but I don't think they really have blues much anymore. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was on Brady Street in Milwaukee, and it was they had this jam session on Sundays, and it was this amazing incubator of talent, mm-hmm. man. You just yeah. had these older <laughs> masters uh-huh. from Chicago and Mississippi, and you know there's guys you probably haven't heard of who were sort of legendary on the Chitlin circuit, yep. like Stokes and Willie Higgins. Um, and uh, then there was the guys everybody knows who, like Luther Allison, Hubert Sumlin, mm-hmm. Pine Top Perkins, Big Eye Willie Smith. I mean, these are the guys who played on Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf Records. Um, Buddy Miles lived there when I lived there. I got to play in his band for about a month really? on nice. and off and made a record with him that who knows whatever happened to that uh-huh. that I played on. Um, so there were, and then there was also Mel Ryan, West Montgomery's organ player. Who oh, we were just God. referencing some of that, who used to teach a little bit at my school. And, and, um, also, you know, I got to play with him around town and got to spend a lot of time hanging with him and talking about Wes and Wes's approach to playing and getting to play through some of those songs with him. It was a pretty fertile environment in the early 1990s in Milwaukee. I really stumbled into, a, into a gem, you know, the, the scene was as good as, any of uh, you know Austin or mm-hmm. you know L.A. or New York and their different yeah. heydays. Milwaukee had this bizarre moment, and I just happened to be there because these guys were all transitory. I mean, uh-huh. uh, I think right after I left, Hubert, someone moved to Jersey, and and Mel moved back to be with his mom, and Buddy Miles moved to back to Texas, and uh-huh. so everybody left. I mean, I just happened to be there in this pocket yeah, of and three years of all places too. Yeah, you know, you it's not like think. everyone was settled there. Right. It was this. It was this way station that uh-huh. we all landed at, and then we all left. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, uh, more shout outs um, for you from Warsaw, Poland, Dallas, La Spezia. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Italy. Uh, San Diego, Louisiana, was- South Carolina, Champlin, Minnesota, Honolulu, Durham, North Carolina, more from New York, Queensland, London, Utah. <laughs> Crazy, right? Wow, we're all over the place. All over the place. So um, we are, I, I still want to cover some, you know, some more of kind of the genres and approaches that you cover in the course um, and save some time to talk about this guitar. The guitar is incredible. So Stay tuned for that. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna love to learn about that. Um, and any questions you have, ask them now, and we'll try to you know, answer them as well. Um, speaking of which, here's one quick question uh, from John Boyd. Love how you change from pick to hybrid and then finger style and even thumb brushing and all the great tone. Any tips for those approaches? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, I, I work really really hard still on um getting a sound with my hands Mm. (laughs) that's i've spent my whole life working on that it's one of the things that was my home court advantage is you know i was raised my father's a guitar player and singer songwriter and i I was raised with the guitar um but as i got to know some of these guitar masters and music masters from playing all different instruments um i i I got lucky because at a very early age, I had people telling me, plug that guitar right into that amp and Mm -hmm. figure it out. Don't look for the answers anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So I spend all my time practicing unplugged. This Mm -hmm. is really an important part of this. Mm -hmm. Um, And honestly, I used to practice plugged in when I was in high school, but I moved to New York City in 96. So I was about 19 or 20 years old. And I moved into a rent-controlled apartment on the fifth floor of a building and uh, you couldn't plug in and practice in there. Mm. So I started practicing unplugged and for hours and hours and hours. And I started to realize, wow, um, if I just practice like this and if I can get this to sound good, Mm -hmm. when I go to plug it in, it's going to be fine. Mm. So to this day, I still practice, you know, acoustically. I Mm -hmm. play a semi hollow instrument, so it makes it easier. But um, I always practice unplugged. I I don't practice plugged in. And then that way, when I go and plug in and do a session or or do a show, um, 
it's exciting because it's like, you know, every time's like you're playing, you know, it's it's just so much easier, right. you know, to get a sound because uh -huh. now you're working with an amplifier. You're yeah. getting something back. Uh -huh. um, so that's the first thing I would recommend is try practicing unplugged and listen to what it sounds like when you... Hmm. That's a great tip. It didn't Wes Montgomery develop his thumb technique entirely because to not bother the neighbors, right? That exactly. was exactly so. And then what you can do with that is even I'll just keep playing on plug. You can probably hear it on my headset mic, but just if you play like learning how to go from the hybrid picking from fingers to pick, I've been doing that my whole life. Like I, I don't even. I, I've never thought about like where am I going to put the pick. Mm -hmm. I was just when I heard something a certain way, I'd flip the pick here, mm -hmm. and I've been doing it like that ever since. But in the video, I talk about how I think of it as bass, middle, treble. So when you pull with the first mm. finger, you get that snap and that treble. Uh -huh. When you play with your pick, you get that mid-range, just perfect even response. And when yep. you play with your thumb, you get that soft, warm response. Huh. So then you know if I play with let me start with uh, the thumb. So then with the pick. Now the thumb and finger. Hmm. And now I'll do it with the amp. So that's the difference. You know, and there's really, to me, between working, you have a master volume here, and between working the volume control mm -hmm. and working the dynamics of my hand mm -hmm. and changing those picking techniques, if I put, like, I have, you know, Princeton Reverb here, I love blackface Fender amps. If I put a blackface Fender on six or seven mm -hmm. and I do that and I just focus on that, I can pretty much get any sound I want mm -hmm. by changing pickups and changing grips mm. in my in my picking hand. <laughs> That's great. Good tip, man. Practice unplugged, right? Yeah. Listen to your hands, man. Just let, you know, get your hands as dynamic and fluid as possible, you know? Cool. Uh, Lee Candiotti asks, can you show us some use of an upper register pedal tone a la Grant Green, George Benson? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I was doing a little bit in the, in the JB thing we did. Um, and I do a really detailed demonstration of the pedal tone thing in the in the series yes, by the way you do. so um the way i contextualize it in the series is um let me give you just one position you can do it in multiple positions but in let's do the key of let's see what's easier to do it in let's do it in the key of g so if you take a g bar chord just to get real basic here for a sec and we take this triad out of the middle of it and the root up here we got that octave something's out of tune That's a little better. So that's your G octave. And then in here, you have the minor third while you're holding the pinky down. Minor third, major third, fourth, flat five, five. And of course, the root is here. And then you can also use this note here, the E. And if you want, you can incorporate the flatted third, you know, the minor third. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what it sounds like. And then the trick is to get the rhythmic playing so you can do slides. And that's a good thing to practice. Like, Of course, this is something that not only Grant Green, but George Benson did this a lot. And George did it pretty <laughs> about as good as you're ever going to do it. But and what I tried to do is have the pedal going up top and sometimes I, I, I always think of the pedal as when the organ player puts his pinky finger down on the high note and plays all those different intervals and rhythms and stuff around it. Some great examples of that are, of course, Jimmy Smith. Um, and uh, a record to check out this is a very special record is a Ronnie Foster record called Two Headed Freep. Listen mm -hmm. to that record. Okay. And then uh, Chester Thompson with Tower of Power, like Back to Oakland. Mm. Um, you know, the solo on Squib Cakes, mm -hmm. that's another one to oh, check yeah. out. So I've copped a lot of licks from Ronnie Foster, Chester Thompson, Jimmy Smith, just as much as I have Grant or George Benson for this particular position. So 
all those notes I demonstrated, now you have to turn them into like little phrases. So there's all these little tricks. Some of them, like I said, I pulled from a keyboard. Some of them I pulled from these guitar players. But I'll just fool around in that spot right now and just kind of show you what you can do. Um, so... <laughs> Great answer. Um, grab your slide. Let's show okay. a little bit of the slide section. Okay. Uh, while you're rigging that, a um, little bit of housekeeping. We uh, Zach published a promo code Scott Live. Um, that'll save you twenty five percent on your next order for a limited time only kind of a thing. And you can also pre-order this course from Scott following the link you see in, in the chat there. Um, also, if you dig this broadcast, dig Scott, having a good time, see that little thumbs up there under the video. Give it a thumbs up if you would and show your love. Um, do we, we have, I think Dusty, is Dusty Broom the slide track? I think it is, yeah. Based on Elmore James' uh, Dust My Broom. Let's do it.
standard tuning. Standard tuning. So there's a section in here in standard tuning. A lot of players, you know, uh, myself included, feel that, oh, you know, you got to go to an open E or open D or some kind of open tuning to be able to take on slide guitar. But um, I, this section really, uh, you know, dismisses <laughs> that rumor. Um, how how often are you playing slide when you're out gigging? Is it not very often, to be honest? Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing up, I used to play uh, a lot of slide in open G. Mm -hmm. I was really obsessed with um, with slide guitar. I used to have a guitar that was in open G or open A, and I was really obsessed with honestly, like the Calif who I call like the California guys, mm -hmm. you know, so and gals. So Bonnie Raitt. Um, I remember seeing. I saw Bonnie Raitt, you know, on this is the days of VH1 in the 80s, and I saw her play guitar, and I said, that's the, that's the coolest know, guitar amazing. sound I've ever heard. Right. Like, you know, to me, she's like, she's almost like, it, she's definitely in the league of like a BB King, but, you know, with a slide kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. Um, so when I discovered Bonnie, I also saw Little Feet, and uh, of course, this is after Lil George, but then I found Lil George, and his playing... I mean, he's he's a seismic influence on me as a singer songwriter as everything. I mean, I'm like a little George freak. So really, whenever I used to play slide, I, I was so uh, intimidated, honestly, by Dwayne Allman mm -hmm. and Warren Haynes, who I used to go see that, you know, I would mess around a little bit with slide and standard, but I kind of mm -hmm. just backed away from it. And then uh, when I met my buddy Jay Collins in New York in the sort of like, I guess it would have been about 2004 or five, uh, he was playing in Greg Allman's band mm -hmm. and he was like... Um, I got to get you in this band and it took mm -hmm. him three years, but he, you know, God bless him. He finally got me in there. And, uh, when I met Jay, it was one of the first things he said to me and I started playing guitar in his band. And then he got me, uh, some gigs with Levon Helm and, mm -hmm. and Levon's daughter, Amy and stuff. And, and I, I'm really just really proud of the friendships I have with all of them, to be honest, they're just incredible people and musicians and Levon Mary may rest in peace was just such an inspiration to be around. Um, but during that time, when I was kind of waiting on this Greg Allman gig, mm -hmm. I really brushed it up. Uh -huh. So um, I kind of went and back. Open and open tuning or standard tuning? In standard tuning. Okay. And I really brushed it up, man. I really, like, I got in deep. And, you know, Derek Trucks was also an influence for me when I was getting back into it because yeah, well, he yeah. was doing new things with yeah, it. Yeah, he was. Um, and I was really excited by that. Uh, and uh, that kind of reinvigorated. And and honestly, when I was getting back into playing slide and standard, I really went to Earl Hooker and Robert Nighthawk first because they were the guys who I learned to play slide and standard from. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their stuff is finger style and standard. So they'll play, you know, like um, there's always like um, the slow blues that Robert Nighthawk would play, you know. I kind of went back to that first, and then um, I started working on incorporating more ideas, and somebody who comes up a couple times in the course of this video is uh, Jack Pearson. Mm. So Amazing player. Yeah, yeah. After I got the gig with Greg, I got about two or three years after I got the gig, we were down in Nashville, and I went to uh, a little club and saw uh, Jack Pearson play. And that was like a pivotal moment for me as a guitarist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was probably like 32 years old or so then. Yeah, it was probably 33 or something like that. It's probably about 10 years ago or something. Um, and that that was like, that was a very revelatory moment seeing Jack Pearson play because he did have a guitar that was tuned to open D. He would play slide in, but that, I mean, when he plays slide in standard, he can play bebop lines. Oh, yeah. He can play Elmore James. He can do everything in between. And he just has, like, his intonation is perfect, but he's got this beautiful sound, man. Like, yeah. it's it's not a technical thing with Jack. Like, everything's from the heart, yeah. but he can do these technical things. Like, he can play just like Django Reinhardt or mm -hmm. Wes Montgomery or Dwayne Allman or mm -hmm. Albert King. I mean, he can do it all in the course of one chorus of music sometimes. Yeah, he's 
a savant. I mean, and he yeah. plays many instruments. He's an incredible he does, yeah. acoustic he player. That's right. And, and mandolin. Um, and, he doesn't yeah. get out much. He doesn't like to travel a lot. No, I don't you blame know? him. <laughs> and uh, he's amazing. But Jack Pearson, look yeah. him up, Google him up. What it, you know? I, I know we had him. Uh, we used to do these All Star Guitar Nights yeah, at he's the a NAMM good guy shows. To have for that. Had him a couple of times there. Amazing. Um, let's do. Um, let's pull one more thing out of the course. You did a great section on technique. And talked about some of the BB and Albert, you know, slides and vibrato. Could you give us a quick tutorial on that? Then we'll run a, a track and demonstrate it. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure you guys have enough courses on the three kings, uh, Freddie, Albert, and BB. But, um, you know, you can never get enough. There's of that no stuff. way Come you're on. ever going to get around it. Yeah. These How guys, could you not touch on yeah, that in I this know. course? These guys are the glue between Charlie Christian and Jimi Hendrix. Right. They're the glue that's in yeah. between. And there are plenty of other players who I bring up, um, especially that that one thing I want to touch on before I go into Albert and BB, which everybody has some knowledge of, is the East Texas, Louisiana thing. Because Johnny Guitar Watson, Clarence Gatemouth Brown, Albert Collins, uh, guitar Slim, um, I know I'm missing somebody. Uh, there's just a whole host of, well, of course, T-Bone Walker is like, you know, one of the inventors of the style, <laughs> no. you know. So there's that, That's those are all Texas guys. Yeah. And some of them are East Tex Texas, some of them are Dallas, yeah. you know, and uh, and some of them even, you know, go over into Louisiana. But that that sound is is just as influential on me as is the Chicago sound of Magic Sam and Otis Rush, mm -hmm. as is the sound of um, the Three Kings. So, and the Three Kings are more, you know, BB I believe is from uh, Mississippi. Albert, I can't remember where he's from, but you know, his, his my favorite records of his he made in Memphis with Booker T and the MGs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Freddie King is is also from Texas. Mm -hmm. So there you go. I think he was also from Dallas, if I'm right. I'm sorry to anyone from Texas. I mean, they wrote the don't vocabulary get that, wrong, that we quote today. And so yeah, they many did. Cases, they did. You know. But of all those guys, yeah. I gotta say, Freddie is sort of has been my guiding light mm -hmm. throughout my life. Um, just as a singer, performer, like I love all of Freddie's records. I love the records he did on King in the beginning that really changed the course of guitar with Hideaway and San Jose and mm -hmm. Have You Ever Loved a Woman tore down. But then where he ended up with Leon Russell and uh, you know those incredible records he made with Leon, man, um, Getting Ready and Texas Cannonball. Mm. And then that band, a live band he had with uh, his uh, <laughs> Crazy. his nephews yeah. who were oh, so funky, man. And you see those videos of them. I yeah, mean, oh, yeah. It's just the energy is just <laughs> off crazy. the charts. I know. So I'm not going to cover Freddie right now. All that praise. Uh, uh, we could upon save him. that for. But we'll save round that for two, its man. own. Yeah, its so own special show us, thing. Show us a quick BB thing and a quick. Okay. You well, know, and I'll, then let's let's play. I'll do what I did in the video. It's in the key of G. So I'll I'll start with. Um, this is going to be over a G shuffle, and uh, I'll start with Albert King, and Albert King. Again, everyone knows these licks from uh, from Stevie Ray Vaughan, right? I mean, Stevie Ray kind of reinvigorated this this language. But you have this box right here where if you have the basic pentatonic and you move it up to the extension, and that's like a minor pentatonic, and then there's a note in between the major third. So, all right, and it's kind of going between those two positions. So, the you know the iconic Albert King band. Kind of the the sound, right? Is that that's sort of the Albert King thing? It's more cool. minor based. Yeah. And the BB King thing. Now, when BB started out, I don't know if you guys know like uh, 
that track, just like a woman rock and twist, it's like one of his early, this would probably like a late 50s cut that he did in Memphis. But when BB started out, you know, or Three O'Clock Blues is another one, right? So... <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but it's that kind of T-Bone Walker. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the rock and twist tune. You know, that's how B.B. used to play in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And at some point in his career, I guess it was probably in the early 60s, <laughs> yeah. I want to say, he got in this one box. Uh -huh. Which, of course, is a major scale. And if you dip out of it... And it kind of became, you know, in his own words, it kind of became a second voice that was uh -huh. his call and response. So, yeah. so the the BB King sound is more. Whoops. Whoops. kind of just hung out in that position from then on <laughs> he sure did and that became his thing that's right yeah can we roll the track have you do a little yeah i'll mess around with those i'll kind of try to take those two approaches okay channel them yeah <laughs> do the best i can i mean they're not here so if we don't do it i don't know who's going to you know that's, that's how you pay it forward man let's do it
Now, the uh, answer everyone's been waiting for is, what the heck are you playing there? Oh, Talk yeah. about that guitar of yours. Well, you know, I was talking to you guys earlier about this, and hopefully, um, since they've had that, seems like a really great new crew over at Gibson Guitars, if anybody's watching. Um, I was in the process of doing a signature model of this guitar, so mm -hmm. maybe we can revive it one of these days. Someone's got my schematic somewhere. <laughs> I don't know what happened at Memphis, uh, but uh, someone in Memphis did a, did a thing on this guitar. They know everything about it. So uh -huh. this is a shout-out to anyone at Gibson. Um, if you've got the schematic, give me a call, whoever you are. I don't know you yet. So this is a, a 01 or 02 Custom Shop 336. Um, because of the uh, former regime at Gibson, this is a very confusing model mm -hmm. because uh, I think they had big plans for this guitar when they released it. Um, and, uh, you know, I saw an ad for it, actually, in a guitar magazine randomly, which I don't read guitar magazines very often, mm -hmm. actually, and I just saw this full-page ad. And I was playing a 335 at the time that was, too, was already breaking my back, and mm -hmm. I was only 22 or 23 years old <laughs> or something. And... Um, and I had a Strat and a Tele, and I was kind of taking two guitars to every gig. And I looked yeah. at a picture of that, and I said, well, that, that looks like my speed. It looks like it could be light. It's a little bit smaller. Um, and they were doing something at that time. This, this is the scheme that they abandoned. They were making these in the custom shop in Nashville, and they did something called tonally carved. That mm -hmm. was the selling point. Mm. The inside of this guitar is an arch top sound cavity. So it's like an L5 on the inside, but shrunken down, hmm. miniaturized into this size body. So that's a very unique characteristic of this particular so you, year. So production. you're saying the curvature of the front and back mimics the L5? Or? Apparently, it has something to do with the sound cavity, and you'd have to ask whoever came up with this idea. Yeah. But now, you bought this guitar new. I did. It was like um, twenty seven hundred bucks, but right. I think the list price was like thirty five or something. And back in two thousand one, two thousand and two, or one. I so think you've I been this. playing it ever since, right? I mean, look at it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it looks so, fantastic. So yeah, I mean, this is my baby, man. And so I, there's no chance that you're going to kind of forget it and leave it behind here. At no, Fire I actually. Studios. I went and bought another one <laughs> from the same year. Oh really? It's a tobacco burst. No, so leave it behind. What the hey? <laughs> you want me to leave this fine? No. I don't know if I'm would. ever going to find another one. No. Um, it also has the 59 slim neck, which yeah. they also abandoned at some point at Gibson yeah. because I know I played a bunch of different Gibsons over the course of those years after I got this guitar, and they all had these gigantic necks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like at some point somebody started spreading these rumors about giant strings and giant necks, uh -huh. and they started making everything sure. like that. Yeah, I need a I need a neck I can get my get right, my hands right, on, you know. Right. But They're back needy. in the day it was like the opposite with every player. Yeah. So th these slim necks, these 59 style necks on 335s, 345s, Les Pauls, they're the most the 59 PAF pickups and the 59 necks, that's the that's the creme de la creme. That's the Stradivarius of Gibson for me. So anything that mimics that year of Gibson and I don't know why they got it so right that year, mm -hmm. but I've played a host of 59s mm -hmm. in all those different styles, and they are all insane guitars. Mm. And this guitar, and the copy I have of this, this well, the, the other one I have from that year, um, is the closest I've found. Really? So, um, interestingly, we had a 336, and it's nothing like that guitar. It's like a different guitar, yeah. right? When you looked at it, completely different, right? I mean, it's it's kind of, you know... It's kind of like you do not have to praise it, <laughs> okay? Because the, yeah. we, we love this instrument. This instrument's incredible. Well, with Gibson, it's just like guys, just pick a lane. Yeah. You know, that's that was the problem with yeah. all all the previous years, and I think I'm already seeing great changes there. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. You know, with what this new crew is doing, so I have yeah. I have high hopes, and maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll do something with this. But I've got I customized everything in this. It's got mm -hmm. locking tuners that are spursals. It's got like tusk saddles, custom frets. I do all this with my my tech Paul Schwartz at Picamoose Guitars in New mm -hmm. York City. He's phenomenal luthier. He has a a Plec machine, and it's just an amazing shop that he's got. And um, he's helped me out so much with getting this guitar dialed in. It's got high grade speaker cable inside instead of the standard wiring harness. Mm -hmm. He put the uh, 
the volume in the top of the F-hole. Mm -hmm. So there's no drilling here, mm. which I thought was really ingenious. Very clever, yeah. um, and I was saying on the video, it's it's kind of a funny story. He When he did this for me, I was in a hurry to go on the road, and he'd run out of volume knobs. Uh -huh. So he had a tone knob, uh -huh. and he stuck it in there from a yeah. Strat. Yeah. So I've replaced this a couple times, but I always insist on tone because yeah. I think that's a funny label for it. So give him funny another label props. For it. Um, uh, what's the name of the shop in New York? Peak a moose. Peak like? Peak a moose. P yeah, like the skiing the skiing okay. slope. Okay, cool. I think that's what he named it after. Very cool. Yeah. And then these are Wiz pickups, W-I-Z-Z. -Z. These mm -hmm. are the best hand-wound PAFs I've found. Mm -hmm. And they're very reasonable in price. I mean, I was actually shopping for a set of 59 PAFs, and they can be upwards of three grand. Oh. And this isn't even close, and this Jeez. guy does incredible work. So I highly recommend these pickups. Cool. Um, if anyone's looking for a PAF cologne, mm -hmm. I've been super happy. I put these in about a year or two ago, I think. And it transformed the guitar. And the name of the pickups again, slowly. Wiz, W-I-Z-Z, Wiz okay. Pickups. We try to get the links to these folks Great. in there to give Please them some do. props and stuff. And um, as you said before, I mean, you don't play with a lot of pedals. You, you know, you get all the tones range that you need with your picking your hand your amp typically when you're out gigging when when you play with the almond uh greg almond what amp was in your back line well with greg my primary primarily let me see when i started when i started with greg i had my 65 vibrolux on the road Ooh. my original <laughs> and uh she took a beating yeah um and then uh, the band, as it got larger, when I joined the band, was like a six-piece. When the band went to a nine-piece, I needed to push a little more air. Mm -hmm. And then I got a 65 Super Reverb. Mm. Um, and then I experimented with a AB setup. So mm -hmm. I had a Supro with 115 at one time. Mm -hmm. um, and I experimented with some other amps, but nothing ever came close to the, the Fender. I mean, mm -hmm. I... The whole blackface Fender family for me, and the brownface amps too. Like in the studio, I'll use a Tweed Tweed uh, Deluxe or a mm -hmm. Tweed Twin sometimes from the 50s. Um, but live, when you see me with my band, it's almost always my Vibrolux, either a 65 mm -hmm. or 66 that I have with Celestian speakers. And I do use an overdrive pedal um, live. I don't in the studio, but live I use the exotic Soul Driven. That's the best. Mm -hmm. Exotic is an amazing company. Their guitars, their pedals, I can't mm -hmm. tell you how, how great they are um, in terms of just, their stuff is real transparent and musical, cool. and it really complements the amplifier. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been using the Soul Driven a lot on my gig, and I also have a Strymon, Strymon Flint that I'll use for mm -hmm. the vibrato section yeah. that I really love because it, in the I think it's the 1960 section it has in the vibrato circuit. It sounds just like a Univibe or a Leslie cabinet, mm -hmm. And I think it's better than any Univibe or Wesley clone I've ever used. It's really interesting. But I'll I'll use that for that, or I'll use it for, you know, the Pop Staples, the 65 vibrato. I'll use it in that pedal just to make things a little bit more simple so I don't have to have the But you're pedal. not going out with a big, giant pedal board. That's you're the gonna, pedal board. That's it's it. an exotic huh? Soul Driven and a Strymon Flint. Very cool. And a tuner. Very cool. And a clock, <laughs> so I know what time it is. <laughs> you got to have that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you, man, for car. I, I know we have a little more work to do in the studio, and then you have the photo shoot. But yeah. um, welcome to the True Fire family. We're so excited to have you. Um, we've already talked about all the other projects we're looking forward to doing together. Um, I, 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 I think the world of True Fire who's chimed in and who will chime in later on demand is uh, likewise very psyched. Um, awesome. So thank you for doing that. Um, pick and by the way, show your love. If you haven't yet done so, please click that thumbs up button. Show your love. Help us announce this new and great relationship with Scott. Um, pick. A, oh wait, how about meet that meters groove? You yeah, play that out. Sure, why not? Thank you, everyone, for chiming in. You've got fans all over the world, well, literally. Thank you for uh, thank you for bringing me to them, and thanks for having me, man. You guys are a class act. I tell you, I've had a ball the last oh, two days. Thank you so much. So much it, fun. It's really been our pleasure, and yeah. you know, thrilled with what what's coming out the other end here. That's uh, Southern Roots from Scott Sherrard. Yeah. It's on pre-order. The links in in the uh, thread there. That's the, right. The uh, promo code is in there. Take advantage of that. It's kind of that limited time thing. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure 
honestly, I'm not sure if it's 24 hours, 48 hours, but use it. Uh, get on the pre-order and... Scott, take us out, man. All right. Do a little I, I understand this thing was labeled Meters Groove, right? Well, the me like the meters from New Orleans. Hey, uh, by the way, Tommy, how many hours of content did we get in this course over there? I think we're over four hours. After. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This this course, I'm telling you, it is just jam packed. We only gave you just <laughs> a little taste of the topics, the techniques, the styles. Um, uh, that's covered in this in this master class. So it, it's really something you want to get your hands on. And uh, that's not a gratuitous advertisement. <laughs> it's reality. Do it. Cool. All right, play us out, man. Well, since this is in the style of the meters, we got to say rest in peace, Art Neville. He passed away yesterday. Uh, oh, did he really? He did, yeah. Oh, the geez. organist and vocalist for the meters. Oh, my God. He had a good run. He was 81, but we're going to miss him, man. We He's are special. Miss him. You know, fortunately, right, the music lives on, right? We do our best yeah. while we can. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, man. Absolutely. Thank you.